Hello, and welcome to part two of our lecture series on the female reproductive system, where we're going to look at uh, what's occurring within the ovaries. So to start out with, uh, the ovaries are going to be an organ structure. Uh, we take a look at the external covering. What we're going to have is a germinal epithelium, uh, which is going to be a simple cuboidal epithelium, which is going to be the outermost covering. So this is a little different from what we've seen in covering a, a variety of other organs uh, within the body, but essentially a simple cuboidal epithelium, giving us a nice smooth surface along the outside. Underlying that, in two on our diagram to the right, we're going to have the tunica albuginea, essentially a, a kind of a whitish a tunic that's going to be present there, a whitish layer, uh, which is going to be a dense connective capsule. Uh, and that the dense connective tissue capsule is going to be located between the germinal epithelium and the ovary structure itself, what would be the ovarian cortex. Now it's important to keep in mind that even though we've got this germinal epithelium around the outside, the outside covering of the, the ovary, it doesn't have anything to do with the production of egg cells. It's essentially just going to be involved as a protective smooth surface uh, along the outside of the ovary. Now if we take a look at the ovary, like a lot of the organs we've seen before, there are going to be distinct regions within it. So it's going to have a distinct outer region, which is going to be the cortex, and a distinct inner region, which is going to be the medulla. And so within the cortex, we're going to see the ovarian follicles, the structures which we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about because they're going to be around uh, the developing egg as well as involved in the production of a variety of hormones. And so the ovarian follicles are going to be embedded within a connective tissue stroma, uh, essentially a supportive meshwork, uh, and then deeper to the cortex, we're going to have the medulla which is going to be another uh, relatively rich, very vascular stroma. So we're going to have a lot of uh, vascularization to this region, which is going to be important because we're going to need hormones coming into this region, as well as hormones produced by the ovary being picked up by the blood supply and transported uh, throughout the body. Okay, so the structures we're going to focus in on first are going to be the ovarian follicles. And so the ovarian follicles are going to be in essence, a single oocyte, so essentially egg cell, uh, which is going to be developing. And then surrounding that are going to be follicular cells. And these follicular cells are going to be important because they're going to be helping to support the development of the ova, helping to support the development of the egg, as well as producing hormones such as uh, estrogen. Now, if we take a look at what occurs during one of those ovarian cycles that we talked about in part one of this lecture series, we're going to be looking at the start of that. So we're going to start uh, maturation of an ovarian follicle. And so what's going to happen is follicle stimulating hormone, FSH, produced by the pituitary gland, is going to circulate to the body, it's going to circulate to the ovary, and it's going to trigger the development of about 10 to 20 what are referred to as primary ovarian follicles. And so we're going to take these primary ovarian follicles and start to differentiate them. And so what we're going to see is that the follicular cells that were relatively flat previously are going to start to become round or cuboidal. Uh, we take a look at the ovocyte, uh, and it's going to remain relatively uh, the same throughout this process. It's going to be a very large cell, distinct nucleus, uh, relatively euchromatic uh, appearance to the nucleus. We're going to have a very pink region surrounding that, and this is going to be the zona pellucida. Uh, this is going to be formed by cross-linked glycoproteins forming a, a very rich supportive structure uh, around the ova, around the egg cells. Take a look at the follicular cells. We're going to have multiple layers of these cells, and these uh, follicular cells are going to be important because they're going to be doing a variety of things. One of the things that they're going to be doing is converting androgens, which we're going to talk about in a couple slides, into estradiol. So it's going to be converting things that are similar to testosterone into variations of estrogen, into, in essence, estradiol. Uh, it's also going to be involved with producing what's referred to as liqueur folliculi, uh, the liquor or the fluid of the follicle, uh, which is going to start to accumulate uh, in these ovarian follicles. So what we're going to see is what we've described is the ova, the egg to the center, the zona pellucida, the very pink region immediately surrounding it, and then we've got these follicular cells. And these follicular cells are going to be sitting upon a basement membrane. So they're sitting upon a distinct structure. And then outside of that is going to be uh, the theca folliculi, the theca or the connective tissue component associated with these ovarian follicles. And so we're going to be a supportive uh, connective tissue. And these cells out here are going to differentiate into steroid hormone producing structures. 
And so cells within the fecal folliculi within the connective tissue are going to be involved with producing the androgens that those follicular cells then are going to convert into estradiol. Okay, as this uh, ovarian follicle develops, it's going to go from a primary follicle where you're going to start to see, you know, kind of the larger uh, cluster of cells around it, multiple layers of the uh, follicular cells, small amounts of fluid they're going to be accumulating. As we get into what would be a secondary ovarian follicle, kind of the next stage of this developmental process, we're going to have an antrum. So that antrum is going to be a large central cavity of that liquor folliculi, like we've got in uh, what's identified on one on our image to the right. So that's liquor folliculi, again, produced by these follicular cells. It's going to uh, have a number of factors within it, uh, but one of those factors is inhibin. And inhibin is part of a feedback mechanism, which is going to inhibit FSH production. So as these uh, follicles are developing, they're essentially going to signal back to the pituitary to stop producing FSH. That basically, we, we're, we got the process jump started, and we're going to control it from here. There's also going to be an oocyte maturation inhibition factor within the liquor folliculi, which is going to keep that oocyte relatively neutral, relatively uh, in stasis or resting, and it's preventing it from completing meiosis until it's the proper time. And all that's going to be occurring with factors associated with the liquor folliculi, the, the, the fluid within the follicle. We take a look at the uh, theca. It's actually going to break into two distinct regions, a theca interna, about area two on the diagram to the right. I'm sorry, theca interna, area two on the right, and then a theca externa, a more connective tissue region outside of that. The theca interna is going to be an important structure, though, because we're going to have these cells differentiate into steroid-secreting cuboidal cells. And so what's going to happen is LH, that luteinizing hormone that we talked about previously, is going to trigger these theca interna cells that are starting to differentiate to produce androgens such as testosterone. And then FSH, which is still present, uh, maybe at a little bit lower levels because we're starting to inhibit that, is going to cause these follicular cells to make an erythematizing enzyme, that basically an enzyme that is able to convert the testosterone that's being produced into estradiol. And so, in essence, we're going to produce androgen, but that androgen is going to be short-lived because it's going to be converted into estradiol. And that estradiol then is going to start to accumulate. It's going to signal that we've got maturation of the ovarian follicle, and it's going to trigger changes within the uterine wall. Now, a mature or Grothian follicle is one that becomes FSH independent. And so as those levels of follicle stimulating decrease, we're going to look at a variety of uh, those 10 to 20 ovarian follicles that started. Only one, normally only one, relatively few, are going to be able to control their process by becoming FSH independent. They don't need FSH to continue their development. They're able to develop on their own. And what's going to happen then is when they become FSH independent, we're going to start to see the oocyte complete meiosis one. And again, normally only one follicle, only one oocyte is going to be doing this. So it's going to complete meiosis one immediately prior to ovulation. And so what you're going to see is probably not a lot of difference in the appearance of the cell, but you're going to be looking at um, an ovarian follicle that's going to be very, very large, about 2.5 centimeters in diameter. So it's basically going to take up the majority of the size of the ovary. It's going to fill up the entire ovary, in essence. We take a look at the oocyte. We're going to still see uh, the zone of pellucida immediately surrounding it, that area very pink staining and one on the diagram. We're going to have a corona radiata, essentially a, a cluster of follicular cells, single layer, which is going to be immediately surrounding the oocyte, immediately surrounding the zone of pellucida. And when that egg is released, when the ova is released in the process of ovulation, the corona radiata cells are going to go along with it as, again, a protective mechanism. They're going to be lost relatively quickly, but they're still going to be surrounding and supporting that ova a little while longer. Now, this entire structure is going to be sitting within the cumulus oophorus, and this is like a, a little pedestal of follicular cells that keeps the oocyte and the corona radiata, uh, the cells surrounding it, anchored to the rest of the follicular cells, so it's not floating around free within the liquor folliculi, within the, the antrum. It's still anchored at one end of this developing follicle. Now what happens then is that one FSH independent mature or graphing follicle is going to go through the process of ovulation and release 
the egg from the ovary, basically going to burst out, and hopefully that egg is going to be picked up by the oviducts. But still, we're going to focus in on what's occurring within uh, the ovaries at this point. We're going to see a lot of what are referred to as atretic follicles within the ovary. And the way we can look at this is there are about 400,000 follic ovarian follicles present at birth. But only a small percentage of these are going to develop to maturity, only about one through um, one for each ovarian cycle, so about one each 28-day uh, cycle. The rest of them, the others, are either going to be not stimulated, so they're not going to respond to FSH, or they're going to start to go through that process, but they're not going to become mature. They're not going to become that, that mature graphene follicle. What's going to happen is they're going to break down at a variety of stages. And again, this is a protective mechanism so that if there's anything wrong with the egg or anything wrong with the follicular cells, they're going to stop that process of development. And they're going to become what's referred to as atretic, where they're going to start to break down through a process of autolysis. And so it's essentially going to be programmed cell death. And what's going to be left behind is kind of an irregular or wavy collagenous scar. And so we have this mechanism then. We'll have a breakdown of the ovarian follicles that aren't um, essentially developing to the stage where we can have ovulation occurring. Now, ovulation is going to be occurring at the end of the follicular phase, and it's going to be triggered by an LH surge. So again, we can see uh, on the diagram to the right, a follicle-stimulating hormone is going to decrease. Uh, it's going to relatively uh, stable at the end of the follicular phase. Estradiol in blue is continually uh, increasing, again, because that's going to be produced uh, by those follicular cells, again, sending a signal that we've got maturation of that ovarian follicle. And when it gets to a certain level, in, again, indicating that we're at that mature stage, it's going to trigger a spike in LH, a spike in luteinizing hormone. This is going to trigger activation of the collagenases and plasminogen activity within the mature folliculi, which is going to cause, in essence, the ovarian stroma, the connective tissue, to thin, to become ischemic, uh, to weaken, and it promotes the rupturing and release of uh, the ova. So we get release the egg. Now, we're going to focus on what happens to the egg in the next mini lecture, but we're going to focus in here on what's occurring within the ovary itself. Now, the corpus luteum is going to be a temporary endocrine gland, which is going to be produced by the remnants of that ovarian follicle. The remnants of basically what's left behind when that follicle bursts and releases the egg. And it's going to be a temporary structure. We can see it as the kind of orange structure kind of at the top here. So you can see that it takes up kind of a huge amount of the space within the ovary. And it's going to be involved with producing estrogen and progesterone during what would be the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. So we're going to see there are going to be two types of cells within the corpus luteum. We're going to have the granulosa luteum cells, and those are in one on the diagram, and those are going to be derived by the follicular cells. At this point, they're going to be called granulosa cells, but essentially they're follicular cells, the follicle cells that are left behind, and they're going to become very large, uh, very pale staining in appearance, and they're going to be involved now with secreting progesterone. The theca luteum cells are going to be derived from the theca interna cells, and they're going to start to become more smaller, more darker staining. They're going to be like the cells in area two on the, the diagram to the right, and they're going to be involved with secreting estrogen. So again, the cells there are going to be secreting large amounts of progesterone, progesterone and estrogen, which are going to be released from the ovary, again, indicating that we're in the luteal phase of the ovary, and they're going to trigger changes in the uterine wall. Now, if no fertilization and implantation occurs, what's going to happen is that corpus luteum is going to degenerate and break down. If fertilization and implantation occurs, the placenta, essentially within the wall of the uterus, is going to start to produce human chorionic gonadotropin, and the human gonadic, uh, HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, is going to maintain the corpus luteum so that it essentially remains present and enlarged for about six months uh, continually to produce estrogen and progesterone. After about six months, it's going to start to decline because the placenta is going to be able to maintain its, its further development on its own. The corpus luteum, as it breaks down, is going to become a corpus albicans, which is going to leave a dense connective tissue scar uh, present within uh, the ovaries. So you can see some scars that are present there. Again, these are going to be minimized, decreased by macrophages. This finishes our overview of the ovary. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Come back for part three, where we're going to take a look at what occurs within the oviducts and the uterine wall.